Welcome, dear colleagues, dear companions, dear participants. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am Martine Gillard from Rez, France, and I am a cardi an, interventional, an interventional cardiologist. And uh, it's my pleasure to guide you during these 45 minutes in the cat lab of the future. I will be also uh, with the help of uh, Sonia Petronio, which is an uh, interventional cardiologist from um, Italy. So, during these 45 minutes, we will take uh, the point about how to have, have a very nice images with, our, with a reduction of, of uh, radiation, how to perform the physiology analysis of a coronary artery during the angiography in uh, two minutes, less and less, and also how to reduce the radiation of the staff, physician and nurses, with the robotic assistance. Yes, that would be very interesting. So, first of all, uh, please uh, uh, ask questions because you are allowed to do that. There's a chat master, which is Roman Didier. And uh, here on site, you have microphones. So, please ask questions whenever you like and you think it's interesting for you. So, we think we can begin to present the case of a patient and please the slides. So we have uh, an 84 years old man with some risk factors like hypertension and dyslipidia. With a severe aortic stenosis, he's in class three near with a peak velocity of four and a half, a main gradient of 56, uh, a little bit mildly decreased of ejection fraction, 45%, with an akinesia of the inferior wall. The heart team decision was for TAVI, and a coronary angiography f was done before the treatment. So I think it's important to, to replace uh, the, in the context. So it's an a, a old man with a, a bad LV function and a TAVI. So now we will perform the coronary angiography in the cat lab of future. And uh, the first question I think it's important, uh, Sonia, is to, to have a survey. Yes, we will have a poor, the first poll question of the day is uh, do you have a radiographer to handle the system during your case? Yes or no? Please you, vote. You'll need to go on to the interactive poll relevant to Studio Havan. So if you go on to the app and... Yes, you vote and in three minutes the we will have present. your answers. So, uh, Tom, do you have a radiographer in your, in your institution? We do. So, I, yes, so I, I'm, un, I'm aware of there being significant variation in practice. In the UK, we have radiographers actually in every cath lab in most institutions. And so it seems like uh, maybe either a luxury or a hindrance. I'm not sure at times. Um, but someone there to both uh, protect us and protect the patient and get optimal views. So we have the pleasure to have uh, Jean Fajadé, interventional cardiologist, everybody knows him. So Jean, in your cat lab, do you have uh, a radiographer? Uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, um, officially, we have one. <laughs> in 30 years of my, uh, or more, of my experience in the cat lab, I never see it. <laughs> no, I, I tell you the truth. I tell the truth. Exactly, exactly. So perhaps, Sonia, we will have the answer of the audience. Yes. See the answers? The poll has been locked. Oh, yes. So, well, for the 65%, the answer is yes. And only the 35 it's no. So there is quite a big amount. Of, they're not like in your place, Jen. <laughs> So perhaps, uh, Tom, uh, how do you optimize doses during uh, angiography? Do you take care of the dose or do you...? Yeah, so, I mean, we've paid particular attention to this recently. It's become apparent um, in terms of 
both lead, wearing, wearing of lead, uh, protecting the patient in prolonged procedures. So it is a balance between our radiographer and ourselves in the cath lab to achieve optimal imaging. In long cases, then we will be told we need to be uh, mindful of staying in one position for any length of time. In our most recent labs, we've started to have RaySafe available, which means we have an immediate visual cue as to whether we're exposing ourselves too much to, to the radiation. And then the radiographer is monitoring the, the dose to the patient and informing us as we step closer to a point we need to stop. Mm -hmm. And Jean, um, do you limit your angulation uh, when you perform a coronary angiography or not? It depends on the lesion and... Uh... In fact, uh, for the diagnostic coronary angiography, we were... Uh, uh, it, this is our way to work. Eh? Maybe it's excessive, but uh, I learned this like that. I try to uh, transmit uh, this way to perform uh, uh, coronary angiography. In other words, the goal is the quality. The goal is to, at the end of the, of the, the diagnostic uh, procedure, uh, that we will have absolutely no question on what about this, uh, <laughs> this exactly. uh, branch, what about that, what about that. So that's the reason why we have fixed, angular fixed views to perform starting from AP, caudal, cranial, this is an AP, then RAO, caudal, cranial, then we move to the left, caudal for the left main, cranial for the bifurcation, and then the lateral. So, if you count, it's at least eight views for the left coronary system, and for the right, we are doing uh, globally three, three views. So at the end, the total of views or the total of injection, the total of run, is close to 8 to 10 for a standard coronary angiography. And I had a chance, traveling around the world, huh, to see that this is not the rule uh, everywhere. But for me, and I will never change, uh, if we are talking about diagnostic coronary angiography, again, First, the quality. Second, no depth, no question at the end of the angiography. Yes, I think it's, it's a very important key point. The, the, the goal of the coronary angiography is to make a diagnostic. So we, we, need, we need to, to be careful to the contrast media. We need to, per, to be careful to the radiation. But we have to do a diagnostic. So I think it's a... So it's when a I say that, of course, when you see a patient with at least irregularities or uh, some, some lesion. Of course, the normal angiography uh, in three, four uh, views, uh, that this is different. I talk about patient with really coronary artery disease. So there is a question that probably it's repetitive. It says, uh, in your daily practice, did you think of a geographer could be helpful to reduce the X-ray dose of a patient during the procedure? Sure, necessarily, uh, I fully agree, and, uh, but okay, uh, again, uh, I, I don't want to be provocative, but uh, for me it's so evident. The dose for the patient, I don't know in here how many all of you have done at least one coronary diagnostic angiography for you. You can have one in your life, maybe if you're not lucky, two or three, but, so for the patient, the dose, calculation of the dose on life or 30 years, for me, is not a problem. The problem is the exposition for the operator and the team around him. That's a, this is different eh? when you are on the X-ray every day. That's a different one. But then that raises a question as to, you say that you must use a certain number of views. Do you not look to limit views where you feel you've got sufficient diagnosis from the first four or five runs of the, of right. the left system? So you will adapt to minimize Absolutely. that radiation. Okay, so I think we have to move to, to the coronary angiography diagnostic. You can see here the setup of the cat lab with the robots on the table. 
The patient has a virtual uh, reality headset in place, allowing to reduce his anxiety. And as you can see, during the radial puncture, the patient remains comfortable with any expression of pain. We cover the, the robot. Then here it is um, the touch panel. It's very, very easy to use with a smartphone-like interaction. So you can have access easily to your own uh, personal workplace, which included your favorite angulations, frame rates for fluoroscopy and graphy, a dedicated auto positioning function allowed to recall position from ta table side. So when you touch on a preselect angulation, the C arm move automatically in the right position. On the dose optimization, you can uh, see the graphical color coded display of real time dose rate, like uh, a car speedometer. It appears in blue during the fluoroscopy and, and in uh, yellow, like uh, here during the graphy. Here it is uh, the fluoroscopy. And um, in uh, this case, for uh, fluoroscopy, we use uh, 3.75 image per second. And for the graphy here, it is 15 image per second. So we work with a scopy. So now we select another C arm position, just with the preselected position. And then we inject uh, contrast media. You can also appreciate that the flat panel detector is automatically adjusted closer to the patient in order to optimize the distance from the X-ray source to the detector, helping to reduce the dose as recommended by the ALARA principles. Here it is uh, the dose of the graphy, and now we move. Here it is a scopy of 3.75 images per second in blue. And you can see that the dose, the real time is very, very low as for the scopy, but for the graphy, but it's much higher in graphy than in scopy as usual. So you optimize the image scopy and now graphy. So now you, uh, the sequences and the photo that you have been done during the, the coronary angiography have, are very accessible from the touch screen in the gallery application. The gallery application allows to navigate from the different sequences, as we uh, show in uh, in uh, this part of the uh, exam. So I show you again uh, the principle of the gallery. You select the sequences. You can go to the next one, and you can stop and move only with your finger from image to image in order to review everything. So as you, as you can see, the, this patient has an um, uh, important disease. It has a free les vessel disease. I don't show you the uh, right coronary artery, but it's the same. And uh, with um, very low uh, radiation, but uh, for me, uh, high quality of images. We, we can um, uh, perform the diagnostic. So uh, I think we, we will ask another question yes. to the audience. Yes, of course, we will have the second question. So which frame rate do you use for record uh, acquisition? 15 or 7.5 uh, frames per second, or you do not know? Which could be a chance. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Please vote. So, um, uh, Jean, um, do you use uh, rotational angiography 
uh, in the diagnostic uh, coronary angiography? Yes, I, I, I tried to, uh, to use it in a patient with a really, really uh, poor renal function. And uh, what we try to do in order to avoid uh, the total dose of uh, contrast is to uh, use this uh, kind of um, geography. So it's, um, what I will say, it's interesting for, for, the, for the patient, particularly at high risk for uh, renal failure. Second, uh, we have to do not hesitate to have a high dose of contrast. In, in other words, we are doing one, a single, but we have those. In order to have a good uh, angiography, a good print of your artery on the, on the screen, in the different views from the beginning to the end of the rotation. But uh, I think it's really interesting, really interesting. Uh, Tom, what do you think about the possibility to have a real-time dose uh, production during the, uh, the image, the, during the sequences? Yes, yeah, so, I, mean, I think in practice it's incredibly useful. As I suggested, our new cath labs now have RaySafe available, both for understanding the dose that the patient might be receiving, but also those of us within the room. And, and as Jean said, it's less about necessarily the patient's exposure. It's more about us being within the cath lab environment day in, day out, all, all week long. Uh, and we've, we've seen some very interesting you know, findings there that you know, dependent on first operator, second operator, you would think the second operator may actually be less exposed. We've actually found that the combination of being a second operator and short is probably the worst possible combination that the scatter that comes off the patient hits the second person much more. And if you're lower down towards the patient, you're getting it in your face rather than into the lead gown. So actually, if you're in a position where you can monitor, it is probably the most educational element of understanding how to minimize exposure to yourself and your team uh, long term. Really, really important. So, Sonia, do we have the uh, result yes. of the poll? Not yet, really. Oh, yes, they are. there they are. So, oh, the 55% uses 15 frames, and the uh, 36% 7.5, and 9% doesn't know, which is not little. No, but I because think Because we just go in the cat club and, you know, do the angel and sometimes don't think about it. It's a good number, 9%. <laughs> no, 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 really, yeah. no, 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 it's uh, not a joke. Huh? It's, uh, because you, you, you would think low, it huh? would be bigger, no? Yeah, yeah, it's yes. very low. It means that, you know, we are really getting it in the... Yeah. But I think if we have done this poll before, 10 years ago, I think a lot of, the vast majority of the, of the physician does not know. But now I think yes. we have to, all of them are accurate about that. I think it's very, very important. So Jean, um, we know that uh, some angulation like a spider view and so on are, uh, uh, cause most irradiation than the other. So when you perform, for example, a PCI, a complex PCI, do you avoid this type of uh, angulation or, or not? It depends on... Uh... So in routine, we try to avoid um, the, 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 the difficult uh, uh, problem with that uh, in some... Uh, in some lesion, in some PCI, we need to use the, the, these views, particularly when you have to uh, see correctly a bifurcation lesion, uh, look at the left main, for example. Uh, but it's uh, also the same for uh, uh, LCXOM or LAD some LED diagonal. We have to really to find the right uh, projection in order to uh, place your wire yeah. and perform uh, uh, correctly your PCI. Second point, sometimes uh, an angulation will facilitate you the procedure in order but because with this angulation you see very well the bifurcation of the main vessel and the side branch so at the end, the manipulation of the wire and placing the wire to the distal vessel will be faster than to take an angulation where normally you will receive less dose, but uh, if you do not see well the angulation, at the end, the time of procedure will be longer. 
So we have to balance between the best view to facilitate your work and, of course, the best view to try to limit uh, the irradiation. Sometimes it could be difficult. Yes, I think it's uh, always a balance in medicine. So, uh, so do not hesitate if you want to ask a question to go to the micro also, if you don't want uh, to use the, um, the application. There is a question here. Uh, that says that, uh, I mean, uh, we present uh, a cath lab with a table to navigate with different angulation during the angio. Do you really believe that it will help us to facilitate the procedure? So it seems like a little bit sceptical about it, probably because at the beginning it looks complicated, but it isn't. No, it isn't. I think uh, it's um, it's always difficult to to show a table like that and uh, to to make understand what what is the advantage of this uh, kind of table. But very, it's it's very easy because they can adapt um, according to the physician. If I love uh, to to perform, for example, a, a LAO plus a codon and in this indication, and uh, I I just select this uh, angulation, and another physician said, okay, no, I do not. Use Use this, uh, these sequences. I prefer this one. So uh, you have the selection of your best, of your better view, of a better uh, angulation of the of the of the tube. So I think it will be helpful in the daily practice. And then also uh, the possibility for the operator to modify the uh, frame rate. I think it's important because in the vast majority of the patient, when the BMI is not so important, it's okay. You can, uh, you can work with a low frame rate. However, when you have a, a great BMI or when you have a complexity because uh, the patient, the view is not so good, you can increase you, yourself very quickly, you can increase the frame rate in order to have a better uh, analysis of the, of the thing. So this new CAT lab is very important to facilitate your uh, daily practice and to, to, to have a good image for each patient, to adapt your image for the patient. And I think it's, as everything in, the, in cardiology, you adapt the uh, anti treatment, to you adapt everything. It's not uh, rules for everybody. And in this type of guide lab, you can adapt according to the patient that you are uh, doing uh, during the, this uh, uh, diagnostic. So I think it's, it's important to have uh, this kind of, uh, of tools. So, Tom, what are the key uh, elements for you in order to, re to reduce, uh, in the diagnostic, not in PCI, to reduce uh, the radiation? You have the radiographer who will help you, but... Uh... So, I, th I think limiting the views dependent on the diagnostic ability. So, you mentioned about the spider LEO caudal projection giving us a very significant dose. So if in a PA caudal, which would be where I start on the left, I have sufficient separation of the circumflex and LAD, I will avoid the spider projection. So, so I think just being mindful and minimizing the, the views to what's required to make a diagnosis is key. There is a question. It says, in the cath lab of the future, should we go one step back and start with a CT angiogram in order to plan the example, the best view and angulations? That's it's interesting in yes, some uh, way. I think it's, it will be um, a possibility, but you, you perform two exams instead of only one. However, in the t this, uh, this guy, this patient was a, a TAVI patient. So, uh, unfortunately, during this uh, angiography, we have not performed before the CT. However, if we have been performed the CT before, we can uh, have the uh, image of the CT on, on the screen. It's very easy. And you can select when you have, uh, uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to, to make the differentiation between LAD, diagonal, and so you, you, you look for it, you search, you, you use radiation in order to have the best view. With the CT, you can have this view. So you can, on the CT, define what is the best view t in order to have the best, uh, the best analysis of the, of the lesion of the coronary artery disease, and then you can apply 
by transmission of the angulation from the city to the uh, to the scopy to the and you can have that. So if there is a possibility to have the CT before because it's necessary, for example, in the, in the patient heavy assessment, you can use it and you can reduce uh, the, the, the number of regulation that you need in order to analyze uh, a lesion. So it's, it will be a great uh, helpful. In this sense, we, uh, there is the opportunity of having also floral and CT fusion. Exactly. And so mm. in this kind of patient that really needs a CT, you can have that also, option too. Yeah. So uh, just uh, to go on with, uh, with the flu, uh, this, uh, uh, this patient, has, uh, as you remember, has the akinesia of the inferior lateral wall. He has a stenosis on the right coronary artery disease. He has a stenosis on the circumflex. And he, so we decided not to treat this one because uh, there is no uh, viability uh, on the territory. So we decided to, to analyze uh, the LAD uh, before going uh, to, to decide if we or not we, uh, we will be uh, a PCI. Um, and um, we will show you uh, the performance of QFR in order to, to, that you understand that the, this QFR during the coronary angiography takes very uh, short time in order to be performed. So, Remember, QFR is, uh, is uh, done according to the angiography. It's not necessary to insert a wire inside the coronary artery. It's not a FFR. So we will show uh, what happens with this uh, LAD patient. So we are performing here the QFR evaluation on the LED coronary. We have already highlighted several lesions on this LED. So you can appreciate here that the QFR software is directly displayed on the screen. And so we can do the evaluation on the CAT lab on scrub. As you can see here, firstly, we use the online tools uh, that is uh, projected on the right part of the screen here that help us to gain the selection of the second angulation for the QFR analysis. When the uh, second angulation is selected, we will select a landmark on the LED on both projection, as you can see here, in order to synchronize the two angulation. Then we will a pathway will be generated and we just need to correct in case of mistake. The next step will be uh, to do the same for the outline of the LED and as you can see here four lesion was identified as uh, significant uh, from the software. Now it is time to analyze the repercussion on uh, the physiology. So as you can see the QFR uh, result is uh, 0.67, um, so it's significant. And we can identify the free lesion that impact uh, the final result of the QFR. If you look, when you select each lesion, you can um, appreciate the final result if you treat only one, for example, the lesion one, two, or three, what is the um, most impact of your treatment? For example, the lesion one, the final result will be uh, 0 0.85. So this is the first lesion that you should treat in this situation. Then you can also move, as you can see, the final landmark and see the modification of the physiology. So now we are ready uh, to treat the LED. So I select the angulation that I would like to work on it. And as you can see, I can uh, select angle projection and then 
the tube will be moved automatically in this projection and so we are ready to start the angioplasty. Okay, so we saw it uh, takes um, less than uh, one or two minutes. And the great possibility with the uh, QFR is to go in through the vessel and to say you can ever man, uh, place the stance. You, you, you simulate the stance, you simulate the stance, the length of the stance. And according to this uh, length, you can see if there is a decrease of, uh, uh, of the physiologic uh, uh, lesion or not. So it's very helpful for the diagnostic, but also for the, um, for the therapy. So, Tom, uh, this patient has an uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, how can you appreciate the physiology of a lesion in this kind of patient? It's not normal, it's an aortic stenosis patient. Yes, uh, we're facing this increasingly with a, a large number of patients coming through for TAVI assessment and, and assessing their coronaries. Honestly, I think we're often relying upon our assessment of the angiogram. Um, in very severe aortic stenosis, there's a slight anxiety around generating a hyperemic state for us, and the validity is possibly not well tested or, or, or validated. So honestly, we're making an assessment of the angiogram, I think. And um, Jean, um, do you... How do you choose the, uh, the, the, the diameter uh, of your stat? Do you choose on the QF? If you have the QFR, you, you choose on it, or you use only angiography in order to, to calculate? Why are you smiling when you ask this question? <laughs> now, um, what I will say, in, uh, in routine, we select the diameter of the stent according to you know, the image that we have, of the angiography that we have uh, uh, realized a few minutes before, uh, under nitroglycerin all the time. I precise this because sometimes uh, this is not given. In our center, it's systematic. Before starting the diagnostic, nitroglycerin. Before starting a PCI, it's nitroglycerin. And then we are waiting after nitroglycerin injection for at least one minute. And then we do the angiography and we try to, according to the size of the, uh, the catheter, we have the, uh, the, we can calculate the size of the vessel. That's the first point. The second, what is working well, when we have decided to perform a predilatation, uh, we use the size of the balloon inflated uh, in order to measure the size, the real size of the vessel, particularly in proximal to the balloon, and then distal to the balloon, if the balloon is around 15 to 20 uh, millimeter length. That's the two ways to uh, size the, the vessel. I do not talk about uh, intravascular imaging, that's another, another problem, but I think that uh, uh, today, with the quality of uh, what you show on these uh, previous views, uh, the quality of the standard coronary angiography, we can have uh, and appreciate uh, really precisely the size of the, of the stent. Problem is when we have long diffuse coronary artery disease. In other words, a vessel with infiltration from the proximal segment to the distality. So we know that we certainly undersize uh, the evaluation of the size of the vessel, uh, but then it's very difficult to, uh, se to select the size of your balloon, the size of the stent, because we are really again between the too low ba uh, balloon size, and we know that the, the PCI, the result, will be not optimal. And the other side is to select the right size, but with a high risk of uh, dissection. So, because of the diffuseness mm -hmm. of the disease. So again, is uh, we have to balance this. The best way is certainly to, is certainly to 
start with a small balloon under size, re-inject nitroglycerin after the balloon, and then try to uh, go slowly by increasing the size. Again, when you have diffuse coronary artery disease, it's, it's not simple. But for me, it's not simple. Okay, so we have to move to the CAT lab in order to see. Uh, so we decided to perform the uh, angioplasty with the robot assistance. Perform uh, LADPCI with a robotic assistance. The first step is uh, to cover the robotic arm with uh, sterile wraps. Then the robotic drive is positioned at the right height in line with the arterial sheet. The Y connector is loaded into the proximal part, securely in place within the, the single-use cassette. Then we open the single-use cassette, which is where the interventional device will be loaded. We introduce the wire in the guiding and load the, the guide wire into the linear wheels which will advance and retract, retract the guide wire. As you can see, we locked it. Now the PCI will, be, will begin. Professor Durand is comfortably seated at the control station. He can advance, retract and rotate the, the, the guide wire in order to close the lesion. You can see with the left joystick, here is uh, retracted, now is advanced. However, the BW uh, wire was not able to do that, so we use a whisper. We can use two guides in the same time. One is completely fixed, and the other can be uh, mobilized with the robot. So uh, with the rotation, retract, advance, we, um, the wire will, be, uh, close the, will close the lesion and go at the end of the uh, LAD. We just check with the uh, angiography, which uh, it's uh, the fellow who, who perform uh, manually the angiogram at the bedside. So now the wire is in place. We open the cassette. We take out the wire and then we, we put a balloon. It was uh, 15 millimeter, 2.5 millimeter balloon, semi compliant balloon. So he advanced very careful on the wire. So now we, we will lock the wire in the linear wheels and also lock the balloon in another wheels so we can advance wire and balloon at the same time but with the different joystick. So now we fix the balloon in the second wheels the wheels for the balloon or for the start. And then we close the cassette. So now Eric Durand advanced the balloon with the left, with the right joystick. We can advance and remove and he place the balloon on the, on the lesion and the fellow check with the manual angiography. So the fellow inflate the balloon. As you can see, is um, protected from radiation by an uh, important uh, shield. So we work always on the fluoroscopy at 3.75 image per second. And you can see here the blue marker and the graphy when it will be in a yellow uh, color is performed at uh, 
15 images per second. So we, we move the balloon in order to have a, so we say that there is a still a stenosis and we decided to use a non-compliant balloon, eight of length and 2.5 of diameter. So after checking by angiography, we will inflate the balloon. So the fluoroscopy and the graphy will be done by the physician seated on the control station. He can also move uh, the C arm, make the rotation. So now we implant very easily a long stance, 28 of length and uh, 2.5 millimeter of diameter. So he check the right position as usually. Everything is usual. It's just that the physician is not with the um, radiation. So now we inflate the, the stance. So in uh, in scopy, as you can see. So we perform a stand vis, and you can see that for the stand vis, the, the, the radiation is blocked, just the radiation that we need to, to obtain the stand vis. So now we decided that the result is, uh, is OK. We check with the QFR uh, very quickly in order to see if um, the result is, uh, is good or not. And uh, we say that the, the result is, uh, is good. Okay, so just um, a f uh, just a, a, a short question, a short answer, because we have uh, not a lot of time, unfortunately, because we have a lot, a lot of discussion. So, uh, Jean, what is the for you the, the future of the robot? Do you think it will be uh, helpful for the cat lab uh, in the? I, I think uh, we are really at the beginning. Eh? It's the first generation of robot. Here was uh, one from Robocat. Uh, the same for the. The path for Corendus, uh, the core path for Corendus is the first generation. Uh, we need a lot of improvement in order to use this uh, in, in daily practice for uh, all the type of uh, lesion. I strongly believe in the, in the future of the robotic. Why? Because uh, really if it's, it should be helpful for the, for the patient at the end because of the, the precision, uh, millimeter by millimeter. Uh, of the evaluation of the, the length of the lesion, the size of the, the, the vessel, the, the, the delivery of the stent, and of course for the, the team, it's, uh, uh, the radiation is close to zero. So I think, uh, I strongly believe. Um, but really it's the beginning. So we will see some people uh, uh, pro, contra. I have one thing to say. This morning, if I have uh, just 30 seconds, we celebrate the 30 years of uh, transradial access with Ferdinand Kimene. I can tell you the first time I present the, the transradial uh, access for PCI in a French meeting, I will not say the, the type of meeting, but it was in the south of France. It was an unbelievable, you know, I was fired by all the, the, the people uh, telling that this is totally stupid to use a uh, small artery when you have the closure device. And at that time, it was the, uh, the femoral closure device. Look 30 years later, and now 90% of the procedure for coronary are, are performed by transfrider. So we don't know. It's a beginning. I believe that there will be a future, but uh, maybe in the, some years we will say uh, it was not the, uh, the right way to take. Thank you so much. So if I, uh, I heard uh, four key uh, message, I think, for, from this session. The first one is a good image quality with low radiation, uh, um, integrated image uh, based physiology at the table side, and the robotic assistant for, for PCI. So I would like to thank everybody for their interaction, the experts for their uh, teach, and also uh, General Electric uh, for the uh, support for this session. Thank you very much, and have a good Congress. Thank you.